As we get started on the monoslope beef barns and basic design, I do want to give credit to two of my coworkers, Chris Cole and Angie Reek Hintz. They are a program specialist at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and they were instrumental in helping me develop and review this slide presentation that you'll see today. One of the questions that we get asked is, what is a monoslope barn? And basically, it's just what it says. It's a barn where the roof slopes one direction. You'll see that it's higher on the front side, tends to be lower on the back side. It'll have a slope of about a foot and a half minimum for every 12 feet of building width. The advantages of a monoslope barn you'll see listed on, on this particular slide. The one that's primarily that most of my producers indicate why they built that monoslope barn is to control manure runoff. I do have some producers, though, that indicate they see improved performance. From what I've seen on the research results, this tends to be variable and tends to be season dependent. You'll see the, the variability with the improvement in performance and uh, gain and feed efficiency in the periods when there's inclement weather. The other, value, the other uh, advantage that we see on a monoslope barn is the value of the manure. This is a slide that we put together using some data from Iowa State University looking at the value of manure from an open feedlot and a monoslope barn. When you look at, at, the, to, at the slide, you'll notice that the value per ton, a per, per ton basis, tends to favor the monoslope barn by $4.70. When you look down through the analysis, you'll notice that most of that is due to the increase in total nitrogen per ton. Looking at it on the basis of space per year, you'll see that it's almost double. This is that most of this advantage comes from the, from the fact that you have twice as much manure produced in that modest slope barn. When I asked producers about the disadvantages of a monoslope barn, we did this about four years ago, we noticed that most of the producers said that they had increased cleaning and labor involved in doing that, as well as increased bedding. Looking down on the side of the cleaning, you'll see that at that time, about half of my producers said that they were, that they were uh, cleaning one time, excuse me, one time per week. I would say now it's probably closer to two times per week. And when you looked at the bedding at that time, they were using a little over pound, four pounds per head per day. Now I'd say that's probably closer to five to six if we were to update this slide. When a monoslope excels, there's basically four times that I see it. When you have those light calves that are coming in, young calves, there tends to be an advantage. Those are the animals that are pretty fragile. You'll also see an advantage for the monoslope or any building when you're getting into periods of mud. The other advantage is when you get into the summertime and you get into heat stress, you'll notice an advantage for a building to prevent solar radiation. This is particularly evident on those big, heavy, black colored steers. And the last group of animals that excels in a monoslope barn would be the dairy steers. Again, they're fragile just like that younger calf. Viewing the monoslope barn from the front, you'll notice that the front view is much taller than the back view is going to be. And this is to take advantage of a couple of things. To be able to take advantage of the southerly winds that you get in the summertime and take advantage of the sun's position uh, in the wintertime. The back of the barn, the height of it, needs to accommodate the equipment that you're going to be using. In that case, you're going to be looking, you know, will it be able to handle that truck that tractor and that wagon. Orientation of a monoslope barn. Most of the barns that we have in northwest Iowa are going to be east-west. Seldom are they north-south, although you'll see in this picture that there was one on the left-hand side that was a north-south location. That was because they were building over existing concrete. The east-west is desirable because it allows you, uh, as I stated, to take advantage of the sun's position. When you're looking at it in the wintertime when the sun is lower in the sky, you'll see that the sun is able to penetrate back further into the barn, uh, providing warmth. The bunk space. If you don't remember anything else off of this presentation, I guess I'd encourage you to think about this. The bunk space is going to set your barn length. The minimum needs to be 12 inches per head, and that's considering both the bunk space on the south bunk and the north bunk. 
consequently, you're going to have barns that are going to be a couple of, of different lengths. You'll have those barns that are long, those barns that are short, depending on the number of head that that producer desires to feed. Looking at the width of the monoslope barn, that also varies. We have wide barns that are 100 feet wide. Those basically will accommodate two animals for every foot of building length. I do have some barns in northwest Iowa that are the medium length, and when you get over into the eastern part of Iowa, into the northeast, you'll find more of the barns tend to be the narrow in terms of 40 foot wide uh, buildings. Those basically would accommodate then one animal for every running foot of length of the barn. Animal density, it's going to depend on several things. It's going to depend on the type of floor. If it's a solid floor, you're going to be looking at an average of 40 square feet with a range of 38 to 50. Slotted floors are going to be more dense in order to encourage the animals to work that manure down through the slab. An average on them is probably around 25 square feet per head, but I've seen that range from 22 to 28. The animal density is going to depend, be dependent on the animal, the size of the animal that you have, and in some cases I've seen it on the type of the animal, whether you're looking at a dairy steer versus a beef steer. Looking at the roof of a monoslope barn, all of them tend to have a steel roof, but where they start to vary is in terms of what they're doing for insulation. And some barns are being insulated in the roof in order to control moisture condensation. Seen in the top picture on the right, some of them are using spray-on foam. I have others that are using a plywood seen in the lower picture. The floors of a monoslope barn tend to be two, two kinds. They're going to be solid if it's a deep bedded facility or a shallow bedded facility. If it's a slatted floor barn, um, you'll see the slats with a pit, a deep pit underneath. Regardless of which kind of floor you use, they need to be enhanced in that monoslope barn. If it's a solid floor, you're going to want to score it in order to prevent animal slippage. If you're in a slatted floor barn, I'm seeing a lot of them going now using installing mats to provide more cushion to the animal and improve animal comfort. In terms of the back of the building, uh, that's where you're going to find the curtain, and that's an important part of this building. There's two kinds of curtains you can use. There's a split curtain, and there's going to be a one-piece curtain. This happens to be an example of a split curtain, which basically the upper curtain is attached two inches below the eave and extends down about three feet. Below that, there's a lower curtain that's, that's attached, it will extend down to a concrete wall that's five feet high. It's important that you uh, have this curtain so that it rolls up from the bottom as it will reduce rodent damage. The one-piece curtain I have seen, it also has an eave vent opening. In this case, there is a curtain below that eave vent that is one piece that's attached to a center rod. When that center rod uh, unrolls, basically you'll see the curtain extend simultaneously to the wall in the eave vent. When it's completely rolled up, it will look like one big, long, slender tube. Raising and lowering the curtain is done a couple of ways. I've seen it done in terms of winching it with roping. In other cases, and what we see more frequently in northwest Iowa is where they're hydraulically operated. You'd like to see a monoslope barn. The goal is to try to keep the cattle dry, protect them from the wind, but still have air movement. And it's critical that you have that air movement, even in the wintertime. The ventilation in that monoslope barn is going to be set by the amount of opening that you have in that curtain in the back. And as you look at those two pictures, you'll see on the upper picture, the curtain is completely open. This might be what it would look like in terms of hot summer conditions. Conversely, you'll see in the lower picture that we have the curtains almost completely closed, and I've, the only times I've really seen it like completely closed has been when there's been a rain event and they're afraid of water uh, pouring into that building. Most of your monoslope barns will have alleys. If it's a wide monoslope barn, it'll have an alley on the north side and the south side. If it's a narrow monoslope barn, it'll be just on the south side. Pen perimeters, there's an exterior wall that's usually concrete of five or six feet, uh, and then above that is steel that goes on up to the roof. The interior walls that I've seen in our monoslope barns have been all concrete. Pen interiors, when you look at them, the bunk apron needs to be wide enough to clean with the existing equipment that you have. Also, you'll want to design that bunk apron with a 12-inch wide step up to help keep that bunk clean and prevent the animal from backing up and defecating in the bunk. 
Bedding management is the two styles. Basically, we have a deep bedded pack and we have the shallow bedded pack. In the deep bedded pack, what the producer will probably do is come in, he will once or twice a week, he will clean around the edge of that pack and the bunk aprons, remove that bed, and let the pa allow the pack in the center of the pack to build up in both volume and in height. This will probably be removed sometime uh, during, the during the closeout of that pen, but I have seen producers keep it longer. In the shallow bedded pen, this is a case where they're coming in, they're completely bedding the pen once or twice weekly. They're doing this for up to three weeks, and then at the end of the third week, they'll come in, they'll totally remove all bedding and manure. I have producers now that are on the monoslope barns that are looking at both systems. I have them taking advantage of the deep bedded pack in the winter time and running the barn, managing the barn that way, uh, allowing that pack to uh, heat up some and provide additional warmth to that animal. Conversely, in the summertime, they're going to the shallow, shallow bedded pack uh, management, basically coming in uh, and allowing, removing that, cooling the temperature of the surface uh, of that pack and allows the animal to more comfort due to heat stress. When you clean a pen, they're going to come in, they're going to clean along the bunk aprons. As you see, uh, they're starting at the, usually at the south bunk first in the top pictures. You'll also see them go to the north side and they'll remove the manure along the north side if there's an alley up in that, uh, feeding alley in that direction. In the case of the lower center picture, I had a producer, what he did was rather than cleaning around the edge, uh, the ends of that pen, as well as the bunk aprons, he chose to leave it so that that pack extends completely from uh, clear across that pen from side to side. To remove the manure, he drives across that pack. The types of bedding vary. There's corn stalks is most common, but I have seen my producers use soybean, stover, and straw when they didn't have corn stalks. And in some locations, I have seen, if they're available, use wood chips. When you add bedding to a pen, it's usually done with the bale shredders you see in the top three pictures. They're going to come in with the corn stalk bales, and as that bale shredder is, is shredding it, they'll drive around the outer edge of the pack or across the top of the pack to distribute the bedding. I do have some producers, though, like the one in the lower left. Basically, what he do, does is put the bale on a spear. He'll drive into it, into the pen, cut the strings on it, and as he drives across, he raises and lowers his uh, spear so that it shakes the bedding loose. When you go to the lower right picture, you'll see another producer. What he does is he drives externally. He doesn't even go into the pen. He has a gun that basically will blow that bedding onto the center of that pack. Regardless of what system the producers are using, the goal is to get it dispersed across that pack in that barn. Manure storage will vary. I have some producers that use a manure bay that's located within the barn that's seen in the upper left corner. If they have those, I've also seen them use what I call a manure speed bump. What this does is prevents effluent from leaving that manure bay and exiting the building. It also prevents water from entering the building from the outside. Some producers will choose to take the manure completely outside. They may stockpile it as seen in the lower left uh, picture out on dirt, or it may be on a concrete pad as seen in the center picture. And I have a few producers now in northwest Iowa that are getting into composting of their manure as seen in the lower right. When you check cattle in the pen, it's done a couple of ways. It may be gated or it may be stepped through. In the gated process, they'll either open it or climb over. Step through process is designed with a cutout as shown here for the producer to be able to go through easily from pen to pen. Gates and latches are an important part. You'll find most of the buildings are built with one or two gates that enter into the pen from the alley. The latches will vary as seen in the bottom three. The strongest of these three latches would be the one in the lower right that's a deadbolt. Feed bunk styles also vary. As you look at these feed bunk styles, some are made with guardrail as seen in the upper left. As you look at the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that some of them use pipe. And in the lower left picture, you'll see that they have both the pipe and cable. The important thing about however you choose to do this, it has to accomplish two things. It has to keep the animal out of the bunk, and it has to keep their heads down so there isn't feed spillage. Watering systems also vary. I have some producers that will put them in the center of the pan, as seen in the upper left picture. This producer is basically designing it so that it's in between the bunk apron and where the bedding pack is located. 
I have other producers that have it located on a wall, as you see in the two lower pictures. Sometimes the, pet, the water will service two pens, as seen on the lower right. Regardless, again, of how they're designed, they're going to be built with a step up in order to keep the waters clean. Lights vary in the building. I have some producers that have lights in both the front and the back, as seen in the upper left picture. I have one producer, though, that I was out to. He decided he didn't need as many lights. He put them just to the front and used less lights. Those lights are going to be fluorescent, and most of them are, are set on a system where they are light sensitive and will come on. Working facilities are uh, very too in terms of what producers do with them. I have some producers that put them in a separate shed that's away from the barn. I have others that choose to put it within the monoslope barn. And I've had some that have put it on the end of it, some of them will put it in the middle of it. If you have questions on this presentation, I would encourage you to uh, contact Chris Cole, Angie Rekins, or me, and you'll see the, uh, what our subject matter expertise uh, basically is, depending on the kind of question that you would have. 